Hello, uh, my name is Ollie, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the interview process uh, and going through some practice questions for biological natural sciences at Cambridge and also for biology at Oxford. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I've just graduated from Trinity College in Cambridge, where I studied natural sciences um, and throughout my degree, I focused on just the biology side of it. But I also took my papers from maths in my first year and also psychology in my second year. And in my final year, I um, focused on zoology. Um, the course at Cambridge is a bit different to that at Oxford. Uh, at Cambridge, it's called Natural Sciences, uh, and Natural Sciences encompasses uh, biology, uh, chemistry, and physics, and it also requires you to take um, a maths paper in your first year, uh, whereas at Oxford, you just focus on biology, and so you don't have the option to taking, as taking the, the other sciences alongside it, which you do get at Cambridge. Um, but as I said, um, at Cambridge, all I did was um, just the biology paper, so I didn't have to take any chemistry or physics throughout my degree. Um, so when did I start preparing for, for, for Oxbridge? I guess I started preparing probably at the end of my first year of sixth form, which is when I kind of decided that I wanted to study um, at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and so I started by, by reading around the subjects, by doing some extra reading, reading some books. Uh, I started writing my personal statement, um, but definitely the majority of my preparation came Came a bit last minute in the weeks and months uh, leading up to my interview uh, exam dates and uh, the deadlines for stuff. Uh, and the kind of preparation I did was obviously reading and writing my personal statement, um, looking up the different courses and colleges at different universities, deciding what I wanted to go for. And then once I decided the, the college, the course, um, preparing for the admissions tests, so doing practice papers uh, and practicing for interviews by doing mock interviews. Um, which is definitely the best way to prepare. Uh, and all of this is, um, I did this quite last minute, but definitely the earlier the better uh, in terms of in terms of getting ahead of stuff. So what's the interview like? Uh, well, they vary between different colleges, um, different colleges, different styles and formats for the interviews. At Trinity, when I had my interview, uh, I had to do an exam beforehand uh, and then bring this exam in with me to the interview. And then my two interviewers kind of look through the paper and ask me questions about why I'd written what I had. Um, before they asked me about um, different things um, to do with wide ranging biology and maths topics. Um, this is definitely not typical. Uh, at some colleges you have one interview with someone else before you go into another room and have an interview with someone else, or you just have one interview. Um, it varies massively, but before you, you're given your interview date, you'll be told um, for each college what they do. Um, for Natsuki, each interview might focus on something different. For example, I was interviewed by uh, one mathematician and one biologist and they kind of took turns asking me different questions about different things. Um, but obviously this is not always the case. Um, so the interview is trying to um, test how you think uh, and see how you're going to respond to problems and approach problems uh, and see how like your critical sk uh, thinking skills are. Uh, and they often start more basic with more basic questions and then move into more complex things that you might not have heard of before, really to try and push you to the limits of your knowledge and try and see what like the extent of what you actually know is. Uh, and they kind of take the form of a, of a supervision, uh, which is what they call them at Cambridge or a tutorial at Oxford. Um, and so kind of just like questioning you, seeing what you know, um, and seeing how you respond to, to challenging questions. So um, some of the preparation that I made sure I did for my interviews was kind of look through all my A-level syllabus, uh, make sure I know everything that they could ask me, and then also look through some of the GCSE syllabus, seeing stuff that I might not have done in a while that could still come up. Um, so I really didn't know kind of all the content that they could have possibly asked me from my from my studies and then also like revise over my personal statement by the time your interview rolls around it can be up to two months after you've actually submitted your personal statement so sometimes it's easy to forget what you've actually written there and so going back through this and kind of making sure that you've got everything down um, and you know everything that you're talking about um, is good uh, and then extra things on top of this um, look through some of the recent science news so kind of a week or two weeks before your interview um, scrolling through some newspaper newspaper sites such as the Guardian Science section to see what's actually going on in the world in the field at the moment is always good. Uh, recent Nobel Prize winners, of course, to see what kind of like the most uh, the the frontier of the subject is and 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 what where the progress is really being made it can be a really nice thing to add into your interview so that they um, you can really show that you are passionate about your subject and you really do enjoy it. Um, and also like show further reading, um, for example going beyond the A-level syllabus. Um, for example, if you know that genetically modified crops do exist, which you've learned in your A-level syllabus, actually, how does this work? How does this happen? 
Um, has this recent mean applied anywhere? Is this in the news at all? Uh, and then from there, you can kind of um, build like more of a, you can, you can build on your A-level knowledge uh, and you can really show that you really do love your subject and you're really passionate about it, um, which is what they're looking for. They're looking for people who can do that. Some general advice for the interviews, probably the most important point is to make sure to really think out loud so the interview can really follow your thought process, really understand what your thinking is and why you're arriving at the answer that you're arriving at. Uh, and this means that the interviewer can, can kind of redirect you if you start to go astray uh, and also means that um, they can really understand why you've arrived at that answer and, um, and like can understand your thought process, the methodical thinking that you're showing. Uh, also, um, kind of it's, it's okay to pause, kind of gather your thoughts uh, before you answer a question and kind of begin your thought process rather than just randomly blurting out kind of the first thing that comes into your head. Uh, and this can really like derail the answer so you then might have to backtrack and becomes a bit messy, whereas if you kind of take a breath, pause for a minute and then start to detail your thought process to, to arrive at your answer eventually um, is, is a much better way of doing it. Uh, also, don't be afraid to ask the interviewer any questions, kind of to repeat themselves more detail on the question. Um, as this can sometimes be a bit, a bit annoying when you don't really hear them properly, especially over Zoom, where you might have dodgy connection or whatever. Um, but this is definitely something that's fine. Don't be, don't be nervous to, to ask them questions. So uh, moving on to some uh, example questions, one question they might ask you um, as a starter question or kind of be a broad question such as uh, how, what is natural selection? How does it work? So it's kind of something you might have a, a stock definition for from A level, um, which you can just tell the examiners. And this is kind of just to like get you into the, uh, the mindset for the questions to come and see that you've got like the base knowledge for it. And so then moving on, they can ask you something like, can you give an example of natural selection in action? So you've got lots of textbook examples here, like the moths during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, you've also got uh, things like Darwin's finches, which you can bring out um, an answer. And then you could answer, but then it doesn't have to be a textbook example, so it can be anything you, you can think of in the moment or you've thought of beforehand. And they might ask you after this, what is the difference between a natural selection and artificial selection? Well, if you've talked about natural selection earlier, uh, you might be able to, to modify this answer. So for example, Whereas natural selection, there was the selection pressures were from natural things in the environment, such as, I don't know, temperature, um, changes in habitat. Artificial selection is those imposed by humans. So, so for example, selection for domestication and of crops and livestock. And so this is kind of be the key difference between them. And you can kind of make sure to communicate that with the, the interviewers, make sure that they can understand why you think that uh, and kind of really take your time over that answer if you need to. Uh, they might then kind of push this topic a bit further. So going on, moving on from domestication, what is easy to domesticate, plants or animals? When they ask you a question like this, there isn't necessarily always a right answer. Um, you can kind of give both sides to the argument. You can argue for plants or you can argue for animals, um, but kind of making sure that you weigh up um, the differences and, and kind of making sure of the key points before you arrive at an answer that doesn't necessarily have to be either of them. They, they, they're not necessarily cared about your answer. They care about how you arrive at the process and kind of making sure that you consider all the different things in it. Um, and then you can say, they might ask you, how do you expect the domestication of crops to change in the future? So here they might expect you to have like read around subjects like this before. So you might mention things like gene modification. Uh, you might make, mention things like, for example, with climate change, that crops are gonna have to be selected to withstand higher temperatures or longer periods of drought. And then you can maybe bring in a case study here, for example, fires in California, um, or the intense wet rainy summer that we've just had, um, just to kind of bring an example of how, how um, farming might change in the future. Uh, and then they might ask you something like, what are the implications of uh, genetically modified crops? Kind of picking up things from your previous answer uh, that you've kind of talked about uh, and talking about how these can affect the future. So again, you might have read something somewhere about genetically modified crops. You might have learned about it. Um, and you kind of just put this into into like a into reality situation. And here you can draw on things outside of biology. So you might talk about how, for example, in um, less economically developed countries, the genetically modified crops, uh, there might be a benefit to these because you can kind of get crops that might be hardier uh, in, harsh, in harsh temperatures that are coming with climate change um, and things like this, where you can kind of really bring in extra knowledge. Um, they also might ask you a kind of a random rogue question again with no real answer, such as are humans still evolving? Uh, in this example of a question, you kind of have to bring in knowledge from, from several different parts of what you've learned beforehand. So are humans still evolving? So are there any selection pressures still acting on humans? Um, kind of, is there still the whole concept of survival of the fittest? 
uh, and then you can kind of weigh up these kind of these different arguments and then before answering the examiner um, and again there's no real wrong answer here just kind of wanted to see what you are uh, how you answer and how you tackle this kind of bit abstract of a question so uh, following the same template from earlier with kind of the more basic question moving on to more difficult ones uh, they may then ask you questions such as what is DNA or what is a gene? Again, so we've got stock um, examples here from GCC and A-level. You can just tell them and then you don't need to go into too much more depth than that um, because kind of the depth of the question they'll they'll prompt you for. You don't need to say um, like random things on top of this because they're expecting you to. Um, next, they might ask you something along the lines of how does the structure of DNA help support its function? And so you probably know the structure of DNA from, from school, but you might not know that like the function of it and what each thing may, may may do so you can begin by then just telling each part of the each part of the structure of dna for example you might mention the the double helix strand or, or the, the sugar phosphate backbone and you may mention how this protects the bases protects against mutations uh, it holds its structure um, and things like this and then they can kind of see that how you're applying the knowledge of what you know the structure is to how this might support the function which you also know what it is so then kind of fusing these two pieces of knowledge together can really show that you are you're engaged with the content um, another kind of question they may ask you is um, from a random strand of dna and um, what could you tell me would be there um, so the, the the random strand of dna would look a bit like random bunches of a's c's g's and t's and so from your knowledge of what dna is you can then say that oh for example these each three of these bases will then match onto a codon and each codon will have its uh, corresponding amino acid these amino acids then combine to form proteins. Um, and whether you'd be able to tell if there was a gene in there, well, there were some telltale signs of when a protein would start. So these would be like start codons, and stop codons. Uh, and so then you look for these particular kind of sequences within this round of DNA. And then from there, you can then kind of look and match up the reference databases to see um, whether you can recognize the protein in there. And then you can see whether the protein, what the protein coded for actually does. Um, and this is how you would look at what the uh, the strand of DNA actually coded for. So uh, moving on to uh, another question they might ask you. They might again ask a kind of simple question to start with. So what is biodiversity? Uh, from this, you can kind of just answer with like another textbook, uh, textbook definition. So biodiversity is the variety of different living things on Earth uh, in, or in one place. And then from there, they might kind of push deeper into the topic of biodiversity ask you something like should we conserve biodiversity and why it's quite an interesting question because it's something that you might not have thought of before so not only obviously people many people would answer that we should conserve biodiversity but but why actually should we do it um do we have an innate responsibility to do so do we have um reliance on biodiversity um there are many different avenues you can go with this question um but all the likelihood is is that the um uh, interview will kind of play devil's advocate with you kind of whatever you say they'll kind of argue with it and, and kind of give an opposing opinion and it's up to you to kind of defend your opinion kind of weigh in what they're saying uh, to kind of so they can kind of see how you respond to this kind of like pressure on your opinion um, they might ask another theory based question so they might ask you something like why do some places have higher biodiversity than others um, again this is a question there's so many avenues you can argue about climate about human um, uh, human impact on different environments uh, or different, for example, ecosystem types. So some places have more niches to fill, so there's more species. Uh, and so this can kind of, again, lead to more of a discussion. They might uh, propose other other things. So you might say it's climate, and they might say, oh, why do some places with similar climates have very different levels of biodiversity? Uh, and then you have to say, oh, some places have different human impacts, for example. And this can kind of lead into a kind of discussion sometimes, which is, um, which the, the interview is kind of seeing how you kind of think on your feet and respond to this kind of thing. Um, then they might kind of move on to more uh, other stuff. So what are some possible outcomes of extinctions? You could provide some examples of some species that have gone extinct here. So you might say, oh, what, the, the dodo, for example, has gone extinct, it's a classic example. Um, but then they're kind of wanting you to know what the actual outcomes of this were, or of outcomes of extinctions in general were. So you could say, well, if a plant species were to go extinct, then all the animals which, which relied upon that plant would go extinct and would then suffer, have to find a different food source, which could affect other possible food sources, other possible plants. Um, and then further um, further up the food chain, this can have impacts. So, so depletions in one certain species may mean that the predator which relies on this prey species um, then has reduced numbers. And so you can kind of get the impact. That the, these extinctions have like massive cascades um, all across the ecosystem and all across different food chains. 
And that's kind of like the thing they're trying to get you from this question is that extinctions don't just happen to one species. They're quite widespread in terms of um, the actual impacts of them. Then they might then press, um, so how do you know if an animal is extinct? Um, and can we ever fully know? And kind of the answer to this question is that, well, we can kind of guess if an animal is extinct, if no one's seen it in a very long time. Um, but then again, they might press, oh, for example, if it's a, if it's a small, very like, lesser known animal, how can we be truly sure we've not seen it? Um, then you can look for traces of it. So if you can see, for example, uh, fecal matter from the organism, that's probably still alive, if you, even if you've not actually seen um, the organism itself. And, and again, so this is another kind of question that could lead to a big, big discussion about actually, can you ever know um, about it? And it kind of the interviewer is going to try and see how you respond to their questions. Um, something, again, you might not have possibly ever thought of before. That's kind of what the interview is about. And again, they might ask you kind of a, a, a quite a topical question, something like, why is climate change such a threat? Um, this is something where you can kind of revise beforehand, kind of look at the news, see what's going on. You can, again, to talk about some, some of the uh, impacts of it recently. So wildfires in California and Australia, um, crop failures and things like this. Um, and then you can talk about the human impact and you can talk about also the, the impact on animals, the impact on um, plants and stuff on life on Earth. And again, they might again um, talk about how climate change could be viewed in positive light. Increased heat, increased CO2 may mean that plants survive better, for example. Uh, and then you kind of have to take this into account and then kind of answer back to them in a kind of way that means that you kind of understand their point, but, but re re reiterating your point or taking their point into account and changing your opinion. It kind of depends how you want to view the question in total. But again, another big discussion question they could ask you. And so um, in conclusion, uh, make sure to think out loud during the interview, make sure the interview can really clearly follow your thought process so that you're kind of making, making sense, kind of build methodically on your answer. Uh, don't worry about being wrong. Um, that's obviously to be expected. Uh, as long as you try your best to answer the specific questions and, and don't go off on different tangents. Um, that's what the interviewers want. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Uh, goodbye.